Uh, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. Today I've got something a little different for you. Um, we're going to be doing a taking a, a first look, really a preliminary look, at a brand new product that the Hot Wire Foam Factory has started making. This product's called Styroplast, and they sent me a sample copy to review. I want to thank them for that right up front. I really appreciate getting an early look at something that's pretty unique, and you're going to see what I mean when we take a look at it actually mixed up in just a minute. Um, when they sent this to me though, they sent some instructions and they sent some um, ideas about some of its properties. So we're going to take a look at those. I mixed up a little bit and we'll take a look at what that came out like. And I'll come up with some ideas about possible uses that I think it could be applied for. Uh, but I'm going to be looking really for you, uh, the listeners, to give me some, the listeners, what is this, a podcast? The viewers, to uh, give me a, um, you know, some ideas on maybe some ways to test it out, some ideas for some its use usages, um, because more brains, I think, applied to this is going to be really helpful, um, as it's really pretty unique stuff. So uh, why don't I stop gabbing about it, and we'll take a closer look at it. So here you see the components of the styroplast, and this is what was sent to me, the parts, the syringe, and this uh, sort of pamphlet that describes some of the materials. And this material, while it is available for sale on the site, I believe, um, has not been finally formulated for its ultimate packaging. So there were no instructions of detail included with it, but one of the Hot Wire Foam Factory employees was nice enough to send me some detailed instructions on some of the things that he thought I should be aware of when trying to first use Styroplast. Um, styroplast is composed of two parts. It's got this very viscous, almost gel material that is comprised of the A part. You need three parts of this mixed to one part of this much thinner resin material. It's an isocyanate, which um, if that name sounds familiar to you, that's similar in composition to um, super glue. And these form a, uh, once you mix them, uh, they form basically a polyurethane plastic, actually. Now, in the mixing, give you a couple comments on that. Um, they did provide a syringe for me to use. Uh, one of the recommendations, though, was to bore out the opening of the syringe so that it'd be able to draw the Part A into it. As the Part A is so thick, it might be really arduous to try to get it through the opening of this. And then you would make, you know, three parts of this to one part of this. The instructions also say that they recommend mechanical mixing for this. Um, but I decided to take a look at it from my previous experience. I've used a lot of polyurethanes. I've used a lot of silicone rubbers, polyurethane rubbers. I've, I've got a good handle on these properties, epoxy resins, that sort of idea. So I decided to try straight up mixing it on my own. So I did a hand, an eyeball measurement in a cup with a line um, of three parts of this, one part of this. I mixed it by hand with a uh, stirring stick, but I mixed it extremely thoroughly. I mixed it for about five minutes watching the clock to make sure I had a good mix for it. It's got a pot life of about uh, 15 minutes or so, I believe, before its properties start to change. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But I would say that doing it by eye, doing it by hand is possible. I got good... Um, uh, curing on the material that I mixed up, which I'll show you, and uh, so I don't feel like the syringe is necessarily important, unless perhaps you were doing very small amounts of materials, in which case it gets very hard to judge those accurately, because by percent error, you start to get bigger and bigger problems as you get smaller and smaller volumes. One thing, though, that concerned me about the syringe was the idea of using it for both of these parts and then having the material cure in it and have the syringe be a one-time use item. Um, cleaning these materials does require acetone before they've cured and uh, getting acetone in there. I mean, it's possible to do, um, but it seemed like more than I wanted to try for my first attempt, so I thought I'd put the syringe aside and go by, um, go by eye for the first attempt. So it is possible. And I think for most applications, most hobbyists are going to be using, you're going to be doing a volume large enough that you could mix it by eye. But just be aware that because these are you know, polyurethane plastics, getting proper curing, it is important to have the proper ratios of these materials. So saying that, what I did is I um, mixed this up and I started to apply it. So let's take a look at what I did. I just grabbed a piece of scrap foam that I had in the back, uh, you know, bin. I've got a, a whole pile of stuff, and sometimes I use it for testing, and sometimes I just want a little piece of foam. Anyway, I got a bunch of this stuff. This is an old riverbed I carved that just didn't come out quite right and had some other problems. And 
I decided to try it in a variety of ways, although they end up looking a little similar, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the first thing I did is, just, I, because I don't know what it does, let's just start spreading it out. So I just spread it out on here. It has a relatively thin consistency, and it will flow and sag when you first mix it. So I did that, let it flow off the corners, then I, um, you know, sort of started piling up a thicker amount over here. Let's see if I can stand this up a little bit. There we go. Then I started piling it up. Um, then I, as I was playing with it, I kept waiting during the pot life of the material, and it does begin to thicken. You know, again, it's a polyurethane plastic. As it begins to move through its chemical change, it begins to change in its consistency. So then once it started to seem a little thicker, I applied it to this corner here. I ran some down the side to see what kinds of, um, of sagging might be possible with it. And then I piled up a big amount here. And then at the very end, I tried to, when it was getting fairly stiff, to build up a large, you know, sort of raised, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, blob, just to see what kind of standing height I could get out of it. Observations on what I've done so far. Well, first of all, um, like many two-part epoxy resins or polyurethane plastics, it's fairly self-leveling. And um, I did not have to bang this out. Um, it does degas itself quite well. There's a very, very, let's see if I can get a close-up of that. Will that focus? Okay. You can see just the appearance of very small amount of bubbles. Uh, one of the things that he mentioned was that humidity can affect some of the properties of this, and that's true of all polyurethane plastics. They absorb moisture from the air, and that can cause bubbling in the material as it cures, in fact, not just from the stirring. But these are incredibly slight, and I don't think they would ever show in the final uh, finish of the material if you were doing any painting at all on this or covering it with any other materials. The um, protection that it affords is impressive. Um, it is because you're coating it in a plastic. I mean, I have to work really hard to dent it and then you get excellent rebound actually. It comes right back. No cracking. Um, you can see here I just put a little dimple in that, but for the amount of force I just applied on that, even on a corner, um, it really, really is resilient and it wants to return to its original shape. Uh, the nice part about that is no cracking, so um, even foam coat, when it's pushed beyond its uh, technical limits, it begins to crack, although it doesn't lift off of the uh, foam substrate, it will crack. Um, this doesn't even do that. Um, of course, if you were to build up a layer, even say two layers thick, you'd have corners that would be basically impregnable. Um, I can't see this under any kind of use receiving damage. Uh, other thoughts. What I did is then when it started to set up a little bit, Keep that in frame. I then decided perhaps it would be a good material to use to make water effects. Um, you could um, stipple it when it begins to set, when it gets to sort of like a mousse, uh, kind of taffy stage. And I tried that a couple times on both of these areas. I kept going back and forth, back and forth, trying to catch it. It's a little tricky to do that. Is it, is it possible? No. But it is tricky because the amount, and I've seen this with other epoxy resins, that window of time whereby it's got the right stiffness to not self-level, but before it gets too stiff that you can't get the right effect in the material is very short. So it's tricky. It's something you could play with. A little bit of experience there might help. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is I kept trying to pile it up on itself, but under its own weight, it, again, it wants to self-level and it wants to push down. So it's not something that you can build sculptures out of. You can't make, um, you know, stalactites out of it or, uh, you know, uh, large, like, you know, I don't know, tyranid bio slime, you know, cones or something. You, you can't do that with it, at least not at this, at the way it's formulated right now. But that's not its intended purpose. I'm just trying to push it beyond its limits. I'm just trying to think of, you know, what kinds of applications can this have? So, having taken a look at it, where do I think um, I'm gonna go from, from here? So where do I go from here? Well, let me, let me give you some first thoughts on the um, on possible uses and some of the things that I've observed. One of the things that was mentioned to me in the um, email that accompanied the product describing how to use um, the Styroplast is that um, it may be difficult to paint. Um, this finishes with a very, very glossy surface. And so it does seem like it might be resistant to painting unless you were to scuff it by you know, sanding with a light grit sandpaper. 
um, although he did mention a couple primers he thought I should try. I'm going to try painting these pieces um, with a couple different primers and see you know, how that um, sticks to it, a little automotive primer, that sort of thing. And, uh, and go from there because of course, you know, for most terrain people, uh, terrain people, terrain hobbyists, there was the word, um, you're, you're going to want to cover this with some kind of material, um, whether it be sand or paint or other materials, flocking, things like that. So getting good adhesion to it will be important. One of the ideas that I had though, and this is my other thing I'm going to try, is that once I've spread it, once it's setting up, uh, but before it's fully set, I'm going to coat it with sand. That's pretty much what I do with the... Um, um, foam cat, uh, the um, foam coat material is that I apply it and then I run sand over it. Now, if the sand, once it's set up enough, doesn't sink below the surface, that should provide an irregular and rough surface that's going to pick up paint pretty well, and that might be an easy way to, um, you know, finish the styroplast surface so that you can apply other materials to it, PVA glues, things like that. Um, one of the other thoughts I had for an application might be. For um, special high-end pieces where you need premium protection, but you're not looking at large, large areas that you need to cover, thought that came to me was doing um, display boards. Oftentimes with a display board, when you're bringing it to a tournament to showcase your army, you want to set it uh, up in the back, you want to build up a hill, and you're going to have exposed corners of foam that are extremely fragile. Applying this to those kinds of pieces are going to make them incredibly durable, but it's not going to be overly arduous to apply it or to finish it. Um, even if you needed to, say, sand some flat surfaces with a little um, high grit um, sandpaper so that you could actually get some paint adhesion. So that was the most um, obvious thought I had about it. Another thought I had was using it actually as an adhesive to bond foam. Um, say if you're building up multiple layers, um, it might be nice to laminate foam together with this material. But saying that, I'm not entirely sure. It doesn't have quite the bonding property to the um, foam as the foam coat does. Saying that, all right, so it, it when I peel this off, it doesn't pull foam off the, the board. That's what I'm saying. But because it's so rigid, because it's so inflexible, you in essence have to peel off large areas of it and it has good adhesion because of that. So that might be an idea is to actually use it as an adhesive for laminating foam together when you want to build say multi-tiered hills or, or that sort of idea um, because it is going to be so rigid. One of the things I should check before I recommend that though is um, warping whether it expands or contracts while it's curing. So that's another test that I'd like to do down the road and take a look at it. But I wanted to give you my first impressions of it. This is all the thoughts that are running through my head taking a look at this uh, new product, Styroplast. And um, if you've got ideas that you think um, I, I should investigate to take a look at these properties a little more, please include them in the you know comments down below. I'd love to get that kind of feedback. And if you've got some particular ideas about how it could be used um, outright, I'd love to hear that too. And we could talk about that in a future video. I expect to return to this product at least one more time and probably two more times depending on some of the experiments that, that I develop. So. I want to thank the Hot Wire Foam Factory again for sending me this, and I want to, I'll want put a link in the um, show notes down below so you can find them if you want to take a look at their Styroplast product, or if you want to look at their foam coat product. They've got hot wire tools that are very nice, hot wire knives, um, all sorts of things. The, the, the entire site is geared towards cutting foam, which is near and dear to every terrain hobbyist's heart, so uh, they're worth a look. Uh, and thank you for uh, watching another Terrence Gabe's video, and I'll be back real soon with another video, so keep an eye on the channel. Thanks.